welcome and thank you for joining us Gino from the Scottish Beekeepers Association. It's a great pleasure to be here and to discuss with you and your members tonight the wonderful world of bees and also of Scottish honey. So in this talk uh, we'll go through a number of uh, different topics, uh, honeybees and pollination. Um, we'll talk about the nest of the bee and we'll then relate that to how a beehive works. We'll briefly discuss Scottish bee plants and then that will lead on to an uh, interesting discussion about what is honey and then we'll, we'll talk about different varieties of Scottish honey. And that will be us ready to receive all of your wonderful uh, questions. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been keeping bees now for about 10 years. Um, I've gone through the Scottish Beekeepers Association full uh, education system uh, and have recently oh, qualified oh, yeah. as a Scottish expert bee master. Um, so that includes doing all the practical exams and all of the theoretical exams. Um, we also, and I also have undertaken the uh, training uh, and teaching of beekeeping uh, certificate. Uh, I'm also active um, in the honey and uh, quality honey world as a judge uh, and also as a honey sommelier, where I go to Italy regularly to, to learn about understanding honey as a food and on understanding honey as um, as one would describe wine and one would describe whiskey or chocolate uh, uh, as a as a form of um, as a source of inspiration and aromas, uh, I'm involved in honey judging at the Royal Highland Show, the National Honey Show, and also commercial uh, honey shows um, down in London. Uh, and I'm also one of the trustees of the Scottish Beekeepers Association. And I'll tell you about that in the next slide. Um, and as well as being a trustee, I'm also the webinar officer. So I organize our lectures during the winter and the early and the spring time for the Scottish Beekeepers. And those are on, are on bee and honey related uh, topics of interest to the community. And it's free and it's open to anyone that wants to join. So if you'd like to join our next webinar, which will be on apitherapy uh, in December, uh, that's something that you can do by going to our Scottish Beekeepers website and uh, logging in, um, be making yourself known. And I also produce honey here in Edinburgh and teach about bees and, and honey. Um, now let's talk about the Scottish Beekeepers Association. So we, are, we have three main principles. Um, we are here to support the education uh, and, and to support the craft of beekeeping. Um, we're here to preserve and to support heritage, culture and science in beekeeping for Scotland. And we're also here to advance environmental protection, conservation and uh, ethical treatment of bees in Scotland. We are like a, an umbrella organisation. Uh, providing governance, education, support, consultation for Scotland. And we also liaise with the government uh, on issues such as uh, the treatment of Varroa, the BHIP working group, for example. Uh, and we are also effectively a community similar to Scotland's Garden Society uh, for beekeepers across the whole spectrum of, um, of different types of beekeeping in Scotland. Um, so some of the things that we do for our members is we provide insurance cover, which is really important uh, so that members don't have to worry about issues to do with, um, with insurance and liability. Um, we provide compensation for, unfortunately, things that happen like theft and vandalism and uh, very serious diseases that bees can get. We, as, an, as I have alluded to, we provide uh, an education system uh, for beginners to gain knowledge through practice and also theory, and then hopefully uh, gaining a, a real solid understanding of bees, beekeeping and plants, which will enable them to be fully autonomous and also supportive of the beekeeping community 
And we also basically create and maintain a culture of beekeeping in Scotland. So that's the webinars, that's our library, the Moyer Library, which is located currently in Edinburgh at Fountain Bridge. Uh, we have a, a monthly magazine. We do uh, a monthly conference and we organize the Royal Highland Show Honey Tent, um, which is at the West Gate and um, workshops and also other honey shows throughout the year. Um, and this is a, a quick peek at our education system. So if you look on the left panel, you'll see that you can start off with um, some modules um, and those modules are one, two, and three, which are kind of the introduction ones. Um, and on the right, you can see what they are. Their base is honeybee management, uh, bee products and forage disease. Um, and then we've got things like biology, bee behavior, physiology, and uh, pheromones. And then more advanced topics, which is seven and eight, which is things like breeding of honeybees and uh, advanced management, um, as well as things like honey judging, uh, in examining bees and honey under the microscope and a host of practical exams on bee husbandry. So that's kind of my preamble and introduction over. Um, what we'll now focus on is the more exciting and juicy topic, which is what is that? What is honeybees and pollination? So this, what we're looking at here, and if if I, I, as you're all muted, I'll just talk over it. But um, a lot of people, including myself before I became a beekeeper, was slightly confused about what honeybee was. And unfortunately, part of the reason for that is that there aren't that many honeybees unless there's a beehive in the area. Um, so we're all pretty familiar with this guy. This is the bumblebee. They're much larger than honeybees. They are because of their large size, they um they can take quite a lot, they, they can experience colder temperatures and still fly around, pollinate and collect nectar. And what you'll notice, not so much now, but um in the late summer and in midsummer, you'll see bumblebees flying just after dawn and just before sunset. They really are very um um robust against the cold. Um, they live in uh, colonies of usually up to 500 individuals and normally at the bottom of hedges or um, there is one uh, recent invasive species of bum bumblebee, the, the tree bumblebee, Bumble hypnorus, and this one has, um, has a tendency to like living in bird nests or in compost bins. They like to be above the ground. Um, and so if you see this bee, this bumblebee uh, in a bird box, don't be alarmed. It's um, it will um, it will eventually leave at the end of the year. Um, then we've got our friend or our pest, which is the wasp. Wasps are, of course, really important. They also live in colonies um, and similar to to bumblebees. Um, what I didn't mention is what's unique about bumblebees and what well, what's what um, bumblebees and wasps generally do is most of the individuals will die off, uh, leaving just the queen at the end of the season. And that queen uh, will go into hibernation. And in doing so, um, they will then, they'll go through winter and then in springtime when the, when the warmth increases, they'll come out of hibernation and their first job is to, to go out and start a new, uh, a new nest to create a new um, cluster, a new cohort of worker uh, individuals. And that's what makes them different from honeybees. Honeybees are darker. They look more like a wasp, but they don't have the bright yellow look about them. They, they live in very large colonies um, between 10 and 40,000 bees. Um, they don't all die off like wasps and bumblebees. They, in the winter time, the population will start to dwindle down to a, a level of about 10,000 bees with the queen. And together as a colony, they go through winter. 
And this is what makes honeybees quite unique and why they were so successful in colonizing uh, Britain once the ice receded in the Ice Age. Um, they mainly live in trees, but in our modern world where trees have been uh, mainly cut down and oak trees are not allowed to get old and have holes in them where bees can live and birds can live, it becomes, bees tend to live in the roofs of people, people's houses, the eaves, abandoned chimneys, things like that. Um, and finally, we have a whole host of critters known as the solitary bees. And this one that's pictured is um, a leaf cutter bee. They're really fascinating and they live really mysterious but antisocial lives. Unlike the, the, in the organisms that I've shown you in the top layer, these bees um, tend to live alone and because they live alone, um, it's and they're not usually, um, they cannot be managed easily in a hive-like structure. Not much is known about them, um, and and so there's a lot of interest now to understand solitary bees better. Um, and they also tend to, um, they live in, they can live in a number of places. They can they can create um, homes in wood homes and soil, uh, in between the cracks of stones and old walls. Um, and so you have to keep your eye out for them, but they pollinate a huge range of different flowers. Um, and uh, they're really important. And we, although the, it's, it's not fully clear, um, it's likely that the solitary bees may be more, um, um, because we don't, yeah, I was going to say that we, we need to be, we need to watch out for them and ensure that we've got healthy populations. Um, now, I don't want you to focus too much on this, but what I do, as we're on the subject, I want you to look at this Asian hornet here. The, this is a, a pest which has just recently become uh, endemic on the Channel Isles, and it's now endemic in France. Um, it's now got nests in the south of England. And as gardeners, you should be aware of the Asian hornets. Um, in the next three to the next couple of years, we are expecting the Asian hornet to come up to Scotland. Um, it's not clear how they're affected by the cold, but they've managed to get uh, into most of Spain and most of France. Um, and so if you do see them, if you could let beekeepers know like if you could notify the the government this would be really helpful because they um they are responsible for a huge loss in uh, honeybees is one of their principal food items is honeybees but they're also quite a strong um organism and the their sting is about five times the 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 power of a bee sting so they are quite they can be quite menacing, especially if you come up against a nest of them by accident and they do kill people in Asia. Um, and so we, as a general public, we, we do need to be aware of these guys and um, and let people know if you find a nest. And um, we're hoping to try and stop them from becoming endemic in Great Britain. Um, but time will tell, especially next spring to see if um, these Asian hornet queens will get a foothold in the south of England. And now finally to our um, uh, just a short discussion on some of the things I've already mentioned about the honeybee. So honeybees are social insects, so they live in large groups. Um, the European honeybee uh, is distributed across Europe, uh, North Africa um, and Western Asia. So Turkey, the Middle East, uh, and up to the Urals. Um, there are three different um, forms of the of honeybee, and you can see one of the most special ones on the top left photograph is the the queen bee. Um, you have the queen, you have the male, which is the drone, and you have the workers. Over ninety nine percent of all of the individuals in the hive are workers, and so. A lot of what we discuss will be about those workers. Um, they are because they one of the important things for gardens and for agriculture in general is the fact that honeybees are the only pollinator or large or or bee species 
with large numbers of individuals available in early spring to pollinate certain flowers because those bumblebees and wasps, they, they need time to build up numbers to have an effect on the environments. And so honeybees are really important, especially um, not so much in Scotland because we don't have a large um, industry in, in apples and pears and things like that. But as you go down south to Kent or if you go to America or other parts of the world, um, app, orchards, uh, having a hives and orchards are really important for good pollination. Uh, not only is it more efficient uh, but also you get more apples um, produced per tree just by having uh, honeybees around. Um, they are originally animals that live in trees, as I've mentioned, and that's a, a picture there of what normally one would see if you were in a, uh, in a forest. Um, and they produce uh, honey, which is um, part of, which is their food for winter. Um, so throughout the season, they store up an excess amount of this wonderful substance, honey, which is used um, effectively like gases in our homes for central heating. The bees will consume this one, this honey, and it gives them the carbohydrate energy in order to um, to actually enable their wing muscles to um, to engage them. And like friction, by doing that with your hands, it produces heat. And the bees can actually generate about 45 centigrade uh, in their uh, middle section of their body called the thorax, which is this, you can see it on the queen, it's this black shiny part. And that's where all the wing muscles are. And together they can just, they can create heat in the hive. And that's what they do all winter to stay warm. Um, and so they wait until it gets um, above uh, a threshold temperature, usually it's about 15 degrees, and then they'll start going out to forage again. Um, and so bees can, the bees will fly out for forage. And it depends where they are. If they're in a very rich area with lots of flowers, then they don't go very far. But if it's, if it's in an, say an arable area where there's not many flowers, they can go up to three miles, but even up to five in really dire straits. So a little bit about bees and what you might, how, what you might see out and about. Um, so bees require a number of different nu nutritional things. So one of the things you'll see is bees on, on flowers collecting pollen. And they even have a, a special pollen basket on their hind legs where they store the compressed pollen and store it there. Um, on the way back and transport it back to the hive using that. Um, so pollen is really important. Pollen is the protein source, it's the fat source, it's the minerals and it's the vitamins. Um, this is what bees are made of. They're made of pollen uh, effectively or reformed pollen. Uh, and nectar is the other thing that you'll see bees doing. You'll see them with their long proboscis tongue um, just like a butterfly, but in a much shorter um, uh, distance, they will be sucking out uh, nectar from the nectaries of flowers. And this is their carbohydrate. So that's like bread for us. This is, this is providing them with water, but also a spectrum of different sugars. So sucrose, glucose, and fructose, and you sometimes get other sugars as well. Um, you'll see some, especially in spring, you'll see bees collecting water and that's because in springtime, the bees are starting to consume more and more honey, but they don't actually eat honey um, in its raw form. They mix it with water, 50-50, and so they, they need the water in order to consume their, their honey. Um, and in springtime, they're building their nests up, and so they're consuming a lot of honey um, to, to create energy so that they can look after all their new larvae. Um, and the last thing is, you're very, very lucky if you see this, you'll see bees collecting tree resin. Um, and then in the hive, you'll see this red resinous material just covering everything. And this is known as propolis. Uh, and propolis is part of the immune system of the bee. It's um, Propolis is this really uh, miraculous natural substance. It's anti 
antibacterial, it's antifungal, and it's also antiviral. And it's um, it's used a lot in herbalism, and a lot of science is now focused on seeing um, how it could be the new antibiotic for the future. Um, so pollination. Um, we probably all know about this being gardeners, um, but there are two types of pollination. You can get self-pollination, and that's when pollen from um, flower A falls onto the female part uh, of flower A. And so you basically end up with um, with a clone of the same of the same individual. Um, however, that's not really what nature likes because the environment changes and perhaps that form is no longer the best one to survive in that environment. Nature likes diversity, and so cross pollination is is something that nature invests in. And so what you what how that works is pollen from flower A goes to um, the female part of, of uh, flower B. And so the genes are just slightly different and those the offspring um, that is in housed within the seed is going to have slightly different genetics to the, the parent plants. And if the environment changes, perhaps that very, that new individual is better suited to the environment and the plant won't be wiped out. Um, so bees are really important for pollinating flowers, um, mainly because um, anatomically, just the way that they are. I don't know if you noticed, but bees are really, really hairy. They've even got hair on their eyes. Um, they're based, and they're also slightly charged. So in the opposite charge of the pollen, so the pollen sticks to them. They're like these massive pollen, they're like pollen brushes flying around. Um, and sometimes it's accidental because the bee might be collecting nectar and the pollen just brushes all over its body. And as it makes its way through the flowers, it's transferring pollen from the anther of one flower to the stigma of another flower of the same species and then pollinating it. Um, and honeybees in particular are really, really efficient at this job. And it's because they're so single-minded. Um, bees, honeybees, when they work a crop like dandelion, they only work dandelion. And so the pollen from dandelion flower A will go to dandelion flower B. And that's different with the bumblebees. You'll notice in the garden, the bumblebee, as it bumbles around, it goes from an apple flower to a dandelion to some other plant and may come back. And so it's not efficient because it's going to different, the pollen's going to the wrong species half the time. And so what you find is with honeybees, you get better pollination than with other species. Um, now, that's so that's really important for flowers uh, and for production of seeds so what bees are really doing in the environment is they're creating more seeds than you normally would get and this is also important for the generation of fruit and vegetables because it gets even more complicated because not only do you need the flower to be pollinated on one place but for example with some fruits um like apples you'll have six pollination sites per flower and if not and if if only half or three quarters of these parts are pollinated, your flower ends up becoming asymmetrical. It, it has that weird shape like you'd get in a French farmer's market, which I know for us, we would uh, we'd find really enjoyable and interesting, but basically means that part of the fruit never developed. And that's the other benefit with honeybees is that with a better, more efficient pollination, you also get more symmetric fruit. Um, which if you are a fruit garden, you can um, you can get a higher great get a higher price for your fruits. So these are the casts that I mentioned. We've got the queen on the left. She's got a very long abdomen, which is the which is the the part at the back of the bee. Um, and sh the drone is the male bee, and that she he's in the middle. He's got these very large eyes and actually some really thick wings and a really quite a heavy duty uh, thorax, big muscles. 
and his his backside abdomen area is more like a cigar shape. Um, and then we've got the worker, and the worker's kind of diminutive, um, but she she has her own specialities. She's got lots of glands which the other bees don't have and allow her to perform lots of tasks that the other bees can't do so well. Um, the drone is produced in summer and the drone is, um, his existence is looking out for wonderful virgin queens when they're produced and the drones compete together to try and mate with the virgin queen. And that's why he's got really big eyes because he's looking in the distance for these virgin queens. Um, and also why he's got such large, such a large thorax because it's the fastest drone that gets to mate with the virgin queen. And what the queen, what the virgin queen does is she goes out on a mating flight um, and it's her job to try and capture as, as, as much sperm as possible uh, during that mating flight. Um, and what we found from research over the years is that the virgin queens that mate with the most drones produce the best colonies. And that's because each drone has a unique um, genetic um, contribution. So this drone might provide um, genetics which allow the workers that the, to, to be very hygienic. Another drone might provide genetics for the workers to be fun, really strong flyers and able to fly far to collect nectar. And so they find that the more drones that are mating with these with the Virgin Queens, the, the better the society is of the, of the bees uh, in the end. And that's kind of how, uh, why um, having a healthy population of drones in an area is so important and may in fact be one of the reasons why in some parts of the UK there are issues with, um, with bees surviving. Um, and this is a wee glimpse into what goes on in the hive. And it turns out that the honeybee workers change their job as they get older. And so when they're first born, what happens is, or rather, when they first hatch out the cell, to be more, <laughs> to be more specific, um, they clean out their cell. They, they, we call it polishing. They, they clean the cell out and make it clean for the queen to lay an egg in it. They then start caring for the larvae in the hive. Um, and then they'll take turns in serving the queen. She has a court of bees that constantly keep her clean, constantly feed her, make sure that everything that she wants is given to her because the queen is an egg laying machine. And so she has to be in top condition to ensure that this colony survives. And then um, in about two weeks in, they, their glands, which produce beeswax, becomes fully activated and they can start producing beeswax. Um, and so they'll start doing that. And the beeswax is used to make the hexagonal combs, which they use to house their baby larvae and also to store honey and to store extra pollen. Um, they'll then start doing more outdoor activities, guarding the hive uh, and pr providing a, a a ventilation by flapping their wings. And this allows a draft to be created in the hive. And they do this to dry honey, but also, but also if, the, if it's too hot in the hive, they can cool it down or they can warm it up. Um, and then eventually after three weeks, the bees will actually leave the hive and go out foraging. And normally in summer, a worker will live uh, a further three weeks outside of the hive before she normally, she dies um, by working herself to death normally, um, collecting and foraging on stuff. Because unlike us, insects have an exo, they have their skeleton on the outside, exoskeleton. And it slowly, slowly gets um, damaged and stops working. Um, and so that's that's the kind of the life of a worker bee. Um, and here is kind of a sneak peek of what happens with the queen. So you can see the queen, she'll actually bend her abdomen, also uh, allows her to reach down to the bottom of the cell where she lays an egg. And it's this beautiful pearl white sort of um, rod that she lays. 
Um, and then what happens is, as in this picture here, the queen, the, these larvae are, start to grow and they're pearly white. Uh, and this wonderful material is uh, royal jelly, which the bees produce um, and feed to the bees, to feed to the larvae. They get that for three days and then they get fed um, grown up food, pollen and honey. Uh, eventually what happens is just like a butterfly goes into a chrysalis, um, they will actually put a piece of beeswax capping on the top and you'll get these little, what look like brown biscuity colored material. And those are the larvae are now actually molting and they're going, they're slowly transforming into adults. Um, and so here you can see this is, this is a, an adult, an, an almost adult bee. Uh, and eventually what happens is they darken and, and they get their color um, and they hatch and come out and start being a bee, an adult bee. So after that, um, that taster of uh, the life in the nest, let's talk about that nest. On occasion, you may be very lucky and you might find this in a tree branch. Now, this is an example of what would it would look like inside of a hollow tree or inside a cave in somewhere like Greece or Libya or uh, cave systems in Africa or maybe parts of France. Um, they have this, um, they create these honeycomb. Normally the middle honeycombs are longer and the ones at the sides are tapered. Um, they, they create, the bees actually, just like penguins in Antarctica, we've all seen those documentaries, the, the bees on the outside are kind of like a blanket layer and they'll actually take it in turns to get to chill slightly and come inside and warm up. And they maintain a nice warm temperature in the middle. And that's so that the larvae in the middle need to be at 35 degrees at all times. And so they're maintaining that temperature by just like a, being like a mother hen, keeping that brood warm. Um, now this, tr this nest on, the outs on a tree branch will not survive the winter in Scotland. This is an example of what can happen if uh, bees don't find somewhere to live. Sometimes they will just plod on a tree branch initially trying to find a, a more appropriate location to build a nest. And then sometimes they don't decide on uh, a good location and they just stay there. And, um, and on this, when people find these, um, they're normally transferred into a beehive if a beekeeper is, um, is, uh, is informed and then they can, they'll survive fine in a beehive. But the, it, it, on this, the problem is, is that they're exposed to the elements, the rain and the wind, and it will just chill them. So another thing uh, about organization of all these honeycomb, all the things which are used to support the, the kids, the larvae, the brood and the pollen, they're all in the middle. And that's because pollen is fed to the, is fed to the larvae. And the adults also eat pollen. But excess honey, which is not to be used immediately is stored in the sites. And the other interesting thing about that is that honey has a really low uh, thermal conductivity. It's a good insulator. So what it's also doing is it's helping keep the heat in. So that's the other secret is that they, they use honey as well as insulation. Now, this is a frame from a beehive. And what I want you to imagine is we're looking kind of side on in this picture. This is now us looking face on in the middle. And we're looking at a number of different structures. So in the middle is the brood. This is um, this golden brown color is the cappings. Uh, and there's all um, developing uh, adult bees underneath it in a chrysalis. Then around it in these holes, it's hard to see, but it's actually filled with pollen. You might be able to see just here this red color, orangey color, which is the different colors of pollen. Um, and then around it in the corners, you'll normally have honey. And this honey is, is used normally to feed the larvae inside. 
in the middle. Now, that organization that the bees naturally do help inform how a beehive actually works. So these are the different components of your average beehive. Starting from the bottom, so we've got a, a, a bottom board and uh, an entrance, and that entrance can be increased or decreased depending on the season. We've got one large box, which we normally refer to in beekeeping as the brood box. And this is the box where it's identical to this picture. This is where the bees live. In this box is the queen, in this box is all the larvae, and in this box is most of the bees. There is something called a queen excluder, but I'll talk, talk about that later. Then what we tend to have are boxes above this, above the main box. These are usually a little bit smaller. Um, and then we have uh, a sort of membrane layer. So this, this inner cover or a crown board is just something to separate the bees from the roof. And the roof is, um, is there to keep the rain out. So how does it work? So in the bottom is really where all, this is where most of the action is. The bees live in here and they're, in, they're exiting and coming back through the entrance at the bottom board. Now, as we get into summer or late spring, when there's a lot of honey being produced, there's not enough room in this box for the honey. And so we encourage them to place it in smaller boxes above. Now, the reason they're smaller is because honey is actually really heavy. This box will weigh about 20 pounds when it's full of honey, so about 12 kilos. Now, if we had large, same sized boxes there, we're talking 25 kilos to lift, which is quite a lot, <laughs> especially when most, most hives are placed in remote locations, which are um, not easy to move um, uh, onto a car adjacent to it, for example. And so we try and make life a little bit easier for ourselves and we use shallower boxes, which will be, which will take, will have less mass of honey in them. So you'll normally see two or three of these in a, in the middle of summer on a, on a beehive. And the question, what makes a, not an, um, a modern beehive different to those used in the past um, is this thing, the queen excluder. So, and it does exactly what the name suggests. It's actually a metal or a plastic sheet with holes punched into it. The holes are, are big enough that the workers can go through, but the queen is too big to get through. So she is stuck in the bottom box. So she's only able to lay eggs in the bottom. And therefore, this is where all the larvae is. And this is where all the pollen will be and where all of the non-honey stuff will end up. In these boxes, they'll just the workers will just shove all the honey there. In a similar way that we saw the honey was put on the edges, the, the top is also an edge. And you can just keep putting more of these boxes on as the honey keeps coming in. And... How does that work during the year? So this is a, a this is a, an example of your average Scottish beekeeping year. From pretty much um, late October until May, we're in the winter season. So the colony has reduced down in size and they've actually formed a cluster, which is almost like a football sized structure and it's very much akin to the situation in Antarctica with penguins, how they will cluster to keep warm. Um, and they will remain like that, consuming honey until it gets warm. And unfortunately in Scotland is we just don't have a spring um, is the best way to put it because it's supposed to be warm in May or um, March and April and it isn't. And so what happens is, especially this year, it was really cold, is it didn't, the, the bees really couldn't get out till the first week of May. Uh, and then the year before was strange because the bee, because it was very warm in the second half of April. 
And so everything was early last year. Uh, but this year, everything was delayed till the 1st of May. And so that's how it is. Things shift about. Um, and as you probably are aware, there are two types of flowers. There's the spring seeded flowers or plants, and there's the summer seeded. Um, and separating the two is the month of June, which is either a blessing or a curse for us. Um, unfortunately, we no longer have the large quantities of clover flower that we once had in the 50s and 60s, mainly because of the change in agriculture and the wide use of uh, chemical fertilizers. But if you go back to, to the 50s, the clover was, there was so much clover in the UK and clover honey was well, was well appreciated and loved. Um, and with the demise of clover and people cutting their grass all the time, removing clover and dandelions, um, the amount of honey and the food for bees has dropped significantly. So if I was to suggest anything, please don't cut clover and uh, consider produce using clover grass. Um, and so our spring flows, um, so start of May, really, until first week of June, there's a whole variety of flowers. And then in summer, in June, it's either nothing or a little bit of clover, it depends. Um, and then July is when the main summer flow starts with the willow herb coming out and then it all kind of dies a death in late August. Um, and if uh, beekeepers go to the hills in autumn, we have the crop ling heather, which is uh, a really special honey from Scotland. Um, and then we've got the ivy, which is still blossoming right now, actually, but it's just too cold for the bees to collect. Whereas in the south of England, they, they do collect ivy honey which is really has a very interesting medicinal taste to it. Um, and just as I was speaking on that, I, our colleague Alan Riach will be giving a more in-depth talk on plants and bees, but I'm just going to mention the really important ones. Um, things in, the, in early spring are important because the early pollen is so important for, um, for bees, uh, in particular things like goat willow. You can see in that photograph, and I find in... Uh, the the community gardens I work with in Edinburgh that um, the the goat willow is the start of the beekeeping year. This is the with the first large quantity of pollen available for bees and wasps and other and bumblebees to actually eat and use to develop their colonies. Um, and because they're trees, they produce a lot of pollen, and that's really important. Are willows so crocus, gorse, dandelion, willows wild cherry, top fruits. Um, this year was a fantastic year for hawthorn, uh, sycamore, sweet chestnut, clovers, the rapeseed out in town, uh, outside of towns, um, the rosemary willow herb, which is a fantastic bee plant, it's not a weed, uh, lime trees, really wonderful, Vasilia and borage, the brambles, Himalayan balsam, in, auto, in August, um, a lot of our bees go to Himalayan balsam. It's the only flower which actually produces a lot of nectar at that time of the year. Um, I'm sure they'll choose another flower if gardeners would put them out. Um, heather and ivy. And a concept I'd really love for you to, to take home with you is the concept of flower cascade. So this is what I suppose a, a good gardener knows already but doesn't know it. Uh, it's a, a beautiful garden, always has flowers open at all times. Um, it's part of the artistic part of gardening. And that's what the bees want as well. There should be no point in your garden when there's no flowers. There should be a, always a flower opening as one closes. So choose your flowers so that there is a continuum of flowers from the early spring to late autumn. Um, and this is what attracts the pollinators in as well. It allow it means that they'll have food all year round, and they're more likely to come to come and live in your garden, as well. So, can I just ask how much time I've got left? Um, I think we, if you've got another few minutes, then um, we could wind up over the next five or six minutes. Is that all right? Sure. Okay. So I'll just, 
I'll just talk a little bit about um, some of the properties of honey. Honey is a natural sweet substance. It's acidic, it's antimicrobial, antifungal, has a lot of wonderful properties um, and also has a huge range of different flavors. Um, we have in Scotland a really rigorous uh, legal instrument, the Honey Scotland Regulations 2015, which I won't read out now, but the gist of it is honey is only made by bees and honey is, um, is also produced by bees from natural sources. Um, and so we do have fantastic um, legal protection for honey. And, and in the picture there, you can see an example of what honey looks like coming out one of those shallow boxes. They'll weigh about two to three kilos. And in this case, this is predominantly lime honey from the tilia trees. Um, you get different types of honey, and these are actually laid out in our legislation. Blossom honey comes from the blossom of flowers. So here you've got the top left, a lavender flower. But also you can get these other uh, types of nectars, which don't come from flowers. So as you probably know, there are actually things called extra floral nectaries. So broad beans and cherry laurel have these nodules where they just produce nectar without a flower. And it's thought it's, it's to attract in ants to come and kill aphids that really uh, cause a lot of grievance to the plant. And the bees will come for that and they will take that nectar as well. So not all honey comes from the flowers is my point. You also have honeydew, which is very rare, but we do occasionally get it. And I get it consistently in some parts of Edinburgh. Uh, it's a dark honey and it's produced mainly from aphids, um, has an unusual uh, flavor, can be quite citrusy, fruity, can also be slightly salty. Um, and in Italy and France, they have a cricket called the McAlpha cricket. So if you go abroad and you see these black honeys, a lot of them come from the McAlpha prunosa cricket. Um, and it has quite a, a, a dark, salty, fruity uh, and sweaty type taste to it. Um, you might see for sale in farmers markets and in shops, uh, full frames, uh, cut comb, sometimes full sections, which are more common from the in honey shows and the circular honeycomb. Um, what you're getting with that is pollen as well on occasion but also sometimes the honey in each cell is slightly different. And so it's a more, um, a more uh, uh, exciting experience than just having honey in a jar. We do have a major issue with honey fraud in the UK. And so we would generally suggest that you buy your honey locally and directly from beekeepers and, uh, and educate yourself on honey fraud um, and it's uh, especially the fact that it's causing a lot of issues with um, uh, in the third world where beekeepers can't afford to continue uh, keeping bees because of it. It's reducing the price too much. Uh, remember that honey is actually a food. It has amazing flavors. You can't, there's no other food item with more varieties of flavor than honey because honey comes from millions of different plants potentially across the world. So, and each has its own flavor from, from sweaty flavors, florals, fruity, tropical fruit, warm condensed milk, aromatics, vegetal, um, cabbage-like tastes, and even some unusual flavors. Um, and so here's some examples of the different states of honey you can have. You can have liquid, but remember, honey always wants to be crystallized. It's supposed to be crystallized, so it won't last long as a liquid. And if it does, that's unusual. Um, it can be hard set. It can be soft set, meaning that it's like ice cream or butter. It's very thick. Or in some cases, like with our unique Ling Heather honey, it can be a gel. Um, you can get flower. You can get monoflorals, which are honeys that derive predominantly from one type of flower. And in Scotland, our main sources of that would be lime, rapeseed, heather, and possibly clovers. Um, but our most common ones are the multiflorals. And this is, this is when you have more than one variety of flower, which actually comes into the, which uh, derives, uh, sorry, which um, is present in the honey. And this provides a really unique taste of the landscape. 
which is difficult to replicate every year because the distribution of species changes slightly each year. So it's like capturing that moment in time and on the palette. Um, so I will just talk a little bit about, and you can maybe ask me questions about this later. So I actually do, I teach about honey and I, I do honey tasting experiences in Edinburgh. And if you are interested, you can get in contact with me about that. And I also teach beekeeping uh, similar to this, but more intense uh, in Edinburgh as well, or online. Um, and I would just say, please choose real honey. Uh, honey fraud kills bees and it puts beekeepers out of business. And the beekeepers really are the um, keeping, by supporting local beekeepers, you're actually supporting your environment. Um, and that's not some that's not what you're going to get if you're buying from unknown origin. So I'd just like to say thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I'm really looking forward to ask to answering any questions that you may have. Do you know, thank you so much. That's just been a, a fascinating talk um, about about bees, what intelligent and incredible creatures they are. And um just the the complexity of their life is quite extraordinary and uh, not something that you would naturally think of when they're buzzing around you and you're in the garden so um it's just been wonderful to learn so much from you about that um one question i have is that we sometimes get uh, bees um i think they are probably honeybees actually looking at your pictures um struggling on our patio they're obviously tired or uh, worn out and and my little my, my children when they were little would go and get a spoon and some honey from the gut from the kitchen and bring it for the bee and I'm just wondering if that's a good thing to do or is there actually something else we should do if we see a bee that's struggling and that we want to try and save yes so very good question now it tends to happen it now it depends on the time of year we tend to get this really warm end of March and you'll get the bumblebee queens and coming out and then it suddenly gets cold in April. Um, and unfortunately, there's not much we can do at that point because when the bees get cold, it's almost like they become paralyzed and they can't move. Um, and so warming them up gives them a second chance of, uh, of getting home to wherever their nest is. Uh, but in terms of feeding them, we always advise not to feed honey to bees and that's because, um, although we, because honey can contain um, particles of um, bacteria which can infect bees, and so especially if the honey is of foreign origin, um, there could be some American fowl brood, for example, in the honey, which is um, which might infect the bee. So always feed sugar syrup to. Um, to bees that you find on pavements and stuff like that. And that way it's impossible for them to catch a disease. Um, so normally they get, get completely exhausted and that's why they end up on patios. And it can also be that they just have frozen because they're just too cold. It happens a lot in spring when they're collecting water it's because the water will be really cold and they'll, they'll actually artificially warm their body to 45 degrees and they'll try and keep their body at that temperature because by consuming the water to bring back to the hive they're cooling themselves down um so you I was, so that would be my suggestion thank you i was thinking as you were talking i was thinking i bet sugar water is a better option so that's good to know i have a small grandson now who will probably go through the same cycle of wanting to help the bees so great to know what i should be doing um i'm wondering is it possible for you to Stop, stop sharing your screen so we can see everybody's faces and then I can yes, check who would like to ask any questions. Um, oh, Caroline, would you like to go for it since you raised your hand so nicely? <laughs> Just unmute myself. Hi there. Um, Hi. I'm Caroline from the Explorer's Garden in Pitlock Creek. I um, have a question that happened in the garden this year in around about July. Um, I was walking through the garden and then within two minutes I'd walked back and there was hundreds of bees on the floor, um, all decapitated. And I, I tried to Google it and I believe some birds do this or, or hornets. And I was just really concerned because there was just hundreds of bees on the floor and I just didn't know what to do. Um, we don't use pesticides or anything like that in the garden, but they had no 
they were only half of of the little and they were tiny little bees so i think they'd come out of the ground near nearby because there's lots of little holes but all of them they were just all all dead and it was just awful so and this happens in this in a short period of time or you found them lying there they were just all lying on the floor. It was like someone scattered a, a bag of currants. There was just hundreds of, right. of little bees. And it's only happened it only happened once. Um it hasn't happened again. Um, but I was just concerned about what might have caused it or why it happened. So you're right to say hornets, because one of the hallmarks of Asian hornets and also sometimes <laughs> European hornets is they will decapitate the honeybee. Uh, as part of their their eating process, uh, I'm not entire. I'm not aware of how prevalent the the European hornet is in Scotland, um, but uh, I I just don't know. It's a really unusual thing to see. I, I don't know if maybe uh, it could have been a bird or it's, it's something. It just dropped a whole load of them, um, or I, I'm not sure. Okay, it was it was really really sad, and um, I was I've been trying to kind of research it and see what it was, but it didn't come up with anything. So, we are hoping also to get some hives in the garden, and um, produce some Mechanopsis honey, um, in our Himalayan section. So, if we were to put hives, is there any particular space in the garden you would suggest that would be better? Um, yes. For... Yes, you want a south facing site plenty of heat and you want easy access for the beekeeper to to get the hives in and out via car um, ideally uh, a water source uh, available nearby and space for the beekeeper to work as well okay. and the beekeeper will require 24 7 access because he's got duty of care for the livestock <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and if you have a walled garden, if you have, that's the perfect location on the north garden, north wall, and the heat of the sun hitting the hives and the wall and re radiates that heat all day. That's why okay. Scottish walled gardens are such an important thing. Okay, so try and pick the sunniest spot. <laughs> exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Welcome from the Explorer's Garden. Exciting to have you with us. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Anne, you've got your hand up. Go for it. Unmute yourself. Off you go. We actually live up in Orkney, on the very far northwest of Orkney. And we have a garden that we are very proud of. It's a tiny garden and it's furthest, probably the furthest north, certainly the furthest northwest garden in your scheme on the UK. Our son, about five miles up the road, on a loch side has bees. We have a beautiful, we have a north, just with you saying north facing wall. We do have a north facing wall and it's right the sun shines on it, but we also get winds coming in off the sea and it's the Atlantic. So it's very damaging to our plants as well. I'm assuming it would be very foolish for us to get one of our son's beehives down on that north facing wall because of the sea. Is so in the garden itself, is it windy? Yes, the wind, though we have a wall which is north facing and does protect a bit from the north wind, winds right. come in everywhere else because we've no other wall and we actually have a wind that often comes in off, I'm going like this, <laughs> yeah. Comes off, yeah, yeah, yeah. Comes off from, from all sides. From all um, sides apart from the north. So well, I was assuming it would not be good for bees. We don't see many honeybees. Even my son's bees don't seem to get down. We get lots of bumblebees. And I found what you were saying at the bumblebees very interesting. But we don't, um, I rarely see honeybees because it's probably too far from my son. And I don't think anybody else has them. I am. Um, so, yes, you can. There is, is an association of beekeepers on Orkney. Yes, um, I know. And I don't, I think they may even use, keep them in polytunnels. But what right. I would suggest is one of the one of the potential things you could do is depends how much innovation you want to uh, undertake. You could build more fit, you could build some fences to try and cut the Great small garden that's the only problem right. the other thing is you could make a you could make a, a bee shed 
Right. And normally it's done here in the central belt of Scotland because of the rain. But yes. in your case, it would be um, it would be to protect mainly from the wind. Yes. Um, and certainly that's that's something that you could do is have them in a shed. So you just have them in a shed, the hive inside the shed with yes. enough room for us. And to you drill a you drill a hole, uh, the same the same height, or you can cut a wee section out, letter box, right, that's all aligned with the um, with their entrance. Yes. Um, and, and it also means if it's bad weather, you can still check them. Uh, yes. My mentor... You have a redundant have... cycle shed that's actually behind that wall. I'm just thinking we could maybe convert that. I hadn't yeah. thought of that. So okay. that's what I would suggest. And yes. uh, well done, by the way, for creating a lovely garden in Orkney. Yes, well, we're very summer. proud of it. Because though there are other ones, but we are proud of where we, where we are. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So you should be, Anne. Well done, you. And uh, how lovely to have someone from Orkney on our November talk. This is brilliant. Now, any other areas of Scotland being represented? Joyce, where are you coming in from? Hello. I'm completely opposite oh. to near southwest Scotland. Near the... Oh, Joyce, your, <laughs> your, your sound is really difficult. Well, it's difficult for me to hear. Is everybody yeah, finding Joyce, maybe put your question in the chat box. Or are you on headphones? Because you could just make sure they're plugged in properly if you're on headphones. Okay. Just struggling to hear you clearly, I'm afraid. I think you said you're from southwest Scotland, so that's fantastic. We are spreading ourselves geographically across the country. Um, but you're, you're very crackly. I'm so sorry. Are you Are you able to type it in? Let's have a look. I can hear typing. And oh, oh, now it was Joyce, I think, who commented on the. Oh, here we are. She commented ah. on the article on Country File about um, the predatory honey. And now we're wondering about polyhives versus wooden hives. Yes. So um, it's quite a debatable topic within the beekeeping community. Our um, tradition is to make hives out of Western red cedar. Um, However, um, in my personal opinion, polyhives are superior, um, and that's because of their incredible insulation. And I choose as far as I can to use polystyrene. Um, and basically the reasoning for it is um, normally our bees would live in tree cavities in old trees, and they would have maybe five or six inches worth of wood around them they're nice toasty and warm in their tree cavities and in a normal beehive made uh, by you know good scottish carpenters or carpenters what whatever they're only about an inch thick and they leak heat and if you use an infrared camera you can just see the hives from miles away they're just leaking heat uh, polystyrene is a good insulator the bees generally do better in them because they're warmer. They don't consume as much honey through the winter because they're warmer. They don't need to do it. So um, I, I think it's really the way to go personally. Um, and that's what I would do. Thank you. I hope Joyce that answers your question adequately. This is incredible. We've gone from Orkney to Gretna. Anybody, we've got time for one more question. Anybody else from another part of the country wanting to ask? Richard, please tell us where you've come from. I'm excited to know. East Lothian, I'm afraid, not very far away. Perfect. It's a central belt. We're covering all areas. Um, my son-in-law has a couple of hives. Uh, he also had uh, an empty polystyrene nuke, which uh, was colonised by... A swarm so he brought that over to me and uh, we opened it up there was very little in the way of honey there was no sign of any larvae so he he pinched a, a brood frame and a honey frame from one of his hives and we put those in the nuke and it seems to have um, they seem to have formed a queen and, and seemed to be a viable colony so um, they're still in the polystyrene nuke. 
that I, over the last few months I've been feeding them with sugar water and and fondant, um, and they've been flying up until a few weeks ago till it got cold. Um, uh, at what stage should I move them into a full size hive next spring, assuming they uh, survive through the winter? Well, so you can keep you keep them as they are until they require uh, a larger uh larger volume so most likely you're looking at mid probably mid-may okay so okay. they'll yeah probably about mid-may you just have to watch so when when you open it and when it's really busy so really kind of swarm season okay and then I would and it's expect really to do with the temperature as well um yeah. so you want the temperatures to be above 15 degrees uh, at night as well. Okay. Goodness, okay. we could wait a long time and have a very short Something window. Like <laughs> yeah, it's a short season in Scotland. Yeah. yeah. And then, and next season, I would just leave them as a as a, a brood uh, hive, um, not aim to put a, a super on top or. Well, that's really a that that's the sort. Of, now you're asking questions of a, a beginner's class, so I'd recommend <laughs> you go along to the East Lothian Beekeepers Association yep. beginners class, or you can attend one of my classes. Right, I will do. Will do. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. There's been such a variety of questions. Um, we could probably manage one more if anybody is desperate to ask something else. Helen, you've raised your hand. Welcome. Where are you coming in from? You need to um, unmute. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm right in the centre of Aberdeenshire, um, right in the middle of farmland. Um, we've got um, 11 acres, which is a bit of a mixture. We've got clover grass, we've got wildflowers, we've got trees. And our neighbour also has got about 50 acres of clover next to us. So Beautiful. plenty of food for bees. He also grows rape and so um, a local beehive beekeeper came and put his hives on our land this year so we've got a cupboard full of jars of honey so we're very very lucky but I've got one query about honeybees he's about five or six hives um they come and go so say they're full and they've got about 50,000 bees in each one so that's about a quarter of a million bees when they arrived did they form any kind of um, problem for the bees that are here at the moment, the bumblebees and the solitary bees, for competing for food was a query I had. Usually no. In very extreme situations where there's a lack of forage, it would be. So in some parts of, of say, agriculturally intense areas where it's all um barleys and wheats and non-flowering crops um that's where you really have to worry in scotland we've got so much uh weeds and background uh forage that it's not a problem uh and also the bumbles and the solitary bees they they feed on different plants a lot of plants flowers are not accessible to honeybees because their tongues are too short whereas various uh, bumbles and solitary bees are, are able to access those. So it's not such a simple picture. But mm. from what you have described, um, the question I would ask is, you have rapeseed for spring, clover in June, um, presumably it's wildflowers in summer. Um, do you have heather as well accessible? No, your site? no unfortunately not. No, we have, um, yeah. Uh, sort of the clover seems to be around quite a long time um because he cuts it for silage and then yeah. as soon as it grows back it, it pops back into flower again that's great um you may want to you may want to still plant for late summer flowers mm. yeah because I, I did wonder about that because we've we've got a bit of a rough ground for us that's full of gorse and brew gorse well. is a great pollen source through the whole year mm. So, yeah, but um, I was sort of realising sort of this September, October, there wasn't an awful lot around um, for them to, con you know, continue feeding on or didn't seem to be for me that they may well have been. But, um, yeah, we don't have anything like Heather around here. 
Okay. Thank you. Has that answered your question okay, Helen? Yeah, no, that has. Yeah, yeah, that was um, something that I was, yeah. Yeah, I thought there was plenty of food for them, but it was always interesting to know just for sure. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I think um, I think we've had a fantastic range of questions. Um, and Gino, it's just been very, very interesting. Thank you so much for um, all of the information. We are hoping to have your colleague back in, I think it'll be our February talk, to talk about um, plant, uh, gardens and bees and planting and bees. So that'll be really interesting, obviously, for um, all our garden owners. Uh, so we will look forward to that and I'll be in touch to organise that. Our next talk is going to be in January. We will have Christmas off um, and we will be um, hopefully exploring the tea gardens of Scotland. So that's a really easy snack and drink option for you all. <laughs> you can all come with your best tea in your nicest cup uh, for the tea gardens of Scotland. You may even have a wee soups on of the tea of Scotland if you're very, very fortunate. Um, so that is the plan for January. We do just need to confirm it, but I'm sure it will. And we'll be back with the bees again, hopefully in February. But meantime, thank you so much, Gino, uh, for such an informative talk and for introducing us all. I hope we're all inspired to either continue or begin our beekeeping journeys. And thank you, everyone who's attended from right across Scotland. It's wonderful to have you with us again. Uh, take care and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.